tips, tips, tips with Tony. Tips, tips, tips with Tony. All about nutrition from your favorite dietitian. Everything you need to digest in your mind. Tips, tips, tips with Tony. Tips, tips, tips with Tony. Making you healthier one bite at a time. Tip with Tony. Tip with Tony. Tip with Tony. Hello and welcome to the Tips with Tony podcast. I'm Tony Marinucci, your registered dietitian, helping you get healthy one bite at a time. I'm very excited for you guys to hear from our next guest. I have virtually in front of me, Abby Smith Ryan, PhD. She is a scientist, an exercise physiologist, sports nutritionist, mom, and just an overall great person and someone who has a lot of knowledge, <laughs> like a lot of knowledge. So I'm super excited to really go deeper into the science so that you guys can really understand, you know, maybe some why I make certain recommendations or maybe if you've heard cer- certain recommendations, whether they're true or not, or what it's based off of. I think it's always important to kind of know where the information is coming from so you can understand it better. So without further ado, Abby, welcome to the Tips with Tony podcast. Thanks so much for the invitation. Happy to be here. Oh, my pleasure. I would love for you to start by introducing yourself, by sharing who you are, what you do, and most importantly, why you do what you do. All right. Uh, Well, as you said, so I am a research nerd. I'm a professor at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Um, I was a former college athlete and uh, really fell in love with the research process. Um, I've been at the university, so I teach and do research, been here for, um, I'm starting my 12th year. And, you know, my main goal with everything that I do is to improve health and quality of life with very practical and feasible and evidence-based approaches. So I love that I get to provide the evidence and then I get to work and chat with people like you that can apply it and filter it out to the people that need it. Yeah, oh, that's such a perfect fit. I'm so excited to jump into today. Um, before I do that, though, I was just stumbling across your Instagram, and I feel like the congratulations are in order. So you were just awarded the Outstanding Sports Scientist of the Year. Um, for like, tell us more about that because just so just to help people understand the credibility we have, like <laughs> that you have, like right now. Um, tell us more about that. That sounds like such an honor. Yeah. It, um, so it's through the National Strength and Conditioning Association. And to me, I think the coolest part is I remember when I joined that organization a long, long time ago, and there were very few women. So in my field, exercise physiology, um, some of the sport nutrition, like this dietary supplement side is very male dominated. And mm. so I joined only two other women in this award over the last 30 years. And it really is this accumulation of um applied exercise and nutrition. So yeah, it was, it's a, a big honor. That's a big, big honor. I'm, I'm re- let's thank you for representing women and making <laughs> us proud. That's amazing. I'm sure you, you probably do. Are there barriers in that field? You kind of mentioned it to a little bit, but what sort of barriers with, if anyone, even though most of the people that we talk to um, here are, are just kind of, you know, avid wellness junkies, but we also do have a lot of like dietitians who listen to the podcast, other people that are in the field of, of health and nutrition. And when it comes to women in science, like, are there barriers that one should expect? Gosh, I think there's so many. And I mean, I think what's great right now is of this conversation about, I mean, to me, there's barriers within the field and what I do, obviously specific to my field, but I think, I don't know if I'd look at it as barriers, but as women, like I have kids and I run a house along with my whole full-time job and this conversation mm-hmm. of invisible work, it's just this amount of load on our plates as well as trying to, you know, do the things we love. So mm-hmm. there's, you know, those barriers I think um, can cross all, all communities. And I think with women, we often take care of everyone else first, and that mm-hmm. includes diet and exercise, which drives a lot of what I do too. How can we um, make things that are feasible and will help women feel better? Yeah, I love that. I love that. Okay, well, so and how long have you been in this? I'm just curious. How long have you been in the field? Um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I had to go to school for a long time and did a lot of research there. So altogether, uh, about fifteen to seventeen. Oh, okay. A decent amount. So that's brings me up for my, my next question, which is 
over the 15 plus years that you've done research, what have you found are like those, the key findings around, let's talk specifically, I want to talk about women's health today. I think that we have a lot of women that listen to this podcast from all, all ages um, and different demographics, but um, I would love for you to kind of speak a little bit about some of those main findings in your research regarding women's health. Gosh, that's a big question. I mean, I think that maybe top the, three. Yeah, maybe I mean, the first three. thing the first thing that comes to mind is really this concept. Like, I mean, I'm in my late 30s, and I was oh, like, we get this messaging of eat less and exercise more, mm. and I think some of that has changed. But really, a lot of this conversation, like the number one thing I see with most w- women, is under eating, yeah, um, or skipping meals, and which then you know you're getting Meat's calories of different types, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And so I think um, just this concept that food is fuel is is one of the the key things. And then we look a lot at timing of nutrients. So how do we, as a, as women, what should we eat before and or after say exercise to help us, um, see better results with what we're trying to do or feel better. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we look also at a lot of, um, kind of dietary supplements and macronutrients to, to see which ones, um, might be more beneficial for women. Yeah. So what are, can you maybe share a little bit about, I, I think people are always interested in supplements and are there any specific supplements that women should be taking on a regular basis? I mean, I think so. But um, so obviously I am a food first person, um, mm-hmm. but even like most of us women are, it's hard to eat enough. And so following like, you know, obviously prioritizing food, um, one of the, you know, I guess a handful, uh, I would say an omega-3 or mm-hmm. an essential fat would be, mm-hmm. it's hard to get in the diet and can be really helpful for hair, skin and nails and brain health and inflammation. Mm-hmm. Um, we study a lot of creatine. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, oh, so it, glad that you're sharing that right now. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it gets this bad rep of it's going to increase weight and bloating and I don't need it for performance. Uh, but there's some really great data across the lifespan, um, where it can really help women not only feel less fatigue, but um, influence kind of depression, anxiety. Uh, mm-hmm. And there's some very fascinating research with uh, during pregnancy and postpartum mm-hmm. with not only the mom, but also uh, the fetus and the baby. Um, and so just trying to remove some of the scare tactics and, and really look at some of the data there. And it's one of those kind of cost effective, um, potentially beneficial dietary supplements. Right, right. So omega three is in creatine. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I guess I, uh, vitamin D mm-hmm. um, is one of those that I would recommend. And then I feel like a lot of active women. Well, the the research shows that active women have more uh, gastrointestinal GI stomach issues, and so often a probiotic comes up depending on what mm-hmm. they're doing, and obviously strain specific. Um, mm-hmm. those, and then. I don't know if we consider whey protein a supplement. I mean, it is, but it's yeah. a less, little less scary. So that yeah. usually, um, and I know you had a podcast on protein intake, but uh, usually protein intake um, can is beneficial to increase for women, um, especially as they age based on some of the science. So I would say a high quality uh, whey protein would be good. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And do you think like any time of day or mostly after a workout or it doesn't really matter? It's a great question. Actually, that goes back to um, another thing I said, I would actually say before exercise, um, Interesting. based on a couple of studies that we did, we really wanted to look at this idea that women often fast before they exercise, whether it be, you know, because my stomach hurts or I don't know what to eat. Um, and actually a, a small amount of protein before exercise versus let's say a carbohydrate or fasting um, actually helps you burn more calories, build muscle and burn more fat. Mm-hmm. Um, and most women, I mean, we're notorious for just exercising fasted you know well it's very it's fasted cardio is like a trendy thing or yeah, or, there, or if we're in that I know and if we're in that mindset of like eat less exercise more you know mm-hmm. or or the or the disordered mindset of I have to earn my food you know the, these are all very problematic things that you know I always tell people like the number one thing I think I end up having conversations with women about is that you're working harder instead of smarter Absolutely. Want to be blunt? You're working stupider. If I <laughs> because yeah. it's like it doesn't. It's not work. It's not working. I know it's not their intention, but like yeah. it's not going to work. It's actually counterproductive of what you're trying to achieve. You know. So 
yeah, work out in a fed state. And we've had people on before too, talking about like knowing, you know, a lot of people I could already hear, maybe they haven't listened to old podcasts and they might saying like, oh, but I don't, you know, my stomach hurts if I don't, if I eat before I work out, which I'm sure you could agree. It just means to then just wait a little bit <laughs> or like, you know, or don't overeat before, but eat something, you know? But, yeah, yeah. And we, yeah, even thinking about, um, you know, well, then what did you eat the night before? Or that's to me where a lot of the dietary supplements come in. Maybe you don't want to have a full meal. I get that. Mm-hmm. Um, but we've looked at something like an essential amino acid supplement that is just more easily absorbed and not like a thick protein shake. Mm-hmm. Um, and then if you still can't eat anything before, make sure you get something in right after which to me is also where something like more easily digested, like a liquid or a yogurt thing, something like that versus a chicken breast, it's going to just enhance recovery because of Mm -hmm. how quick it gets into the bloodstream. Yeah. And maybe you could help with this because I feel like there's so many um, like misconceptions of like the, how open that window is like after post-workout, like, is there a time to sooner, sooner, better than later? Is there a certain time where your body like won't now utilize um, the carbs of the protein post workout as if, as efficiently if it was within a certain time window. Yeah, I mean, I think this is such a funny concept that people, like, why are we debating about it? Like, just eat. Mm-hmm. But if mm-hmm. you, you know, um, I think if we look at the timing window, well, some of it depends. Is well, did you have you eaten anything all day? Like, when was your right. last meal before? Right. Um, right. And then generally, like the the sooner the better. But it depends on exercise. Usually we see around two hours, we see little effect. Um, Mm -hmm. the, the, the reverse side is what I would say is, you know, plan your calories and macros around what you need. Mm -hmm. And if you can put that post exercise, like, um, the sooner, the better. Right, right, right. So now what about, um, I'm just thinking like maybe not everybody has a fat loss goal or Mm -hmm. maybe not everybody is, is working out, you know, five days a week, maybe, maybe not everyone's doing strength training workouts or maybe they're not very active. How does that now change? How do their needs end up changing in regards to, I know we already talked about protein, but it is such an essential kind of conversation, I would say. So we'll talk specifically about protein. And then I guess we can talk about carbohydrates and fat after if there's any sort of differences based on activity level. Yeah. I, one way I like to look at it and that we have in the research is actually looking at carbs and protein together. Um, And so I would say for women, just in general, we have higher protein needs. That does not mean we need, you know, don't need carbohydrates, but I like to pair them. So for example, like most of us women know how to get enough carbs. They taste delicious and that's what we eat. Um, But if I'm having, for example, the, the research for women really shows about a two to one carb to protein ratio is optimal just generally speaking, unless we have, you know, high endurance goals and et cetera. So Meaning that would just, two, just for the clarity for the listeners, yep. I, I know what you're saying for the listeners, two to one, meaning like 30 grams of pr- carbohydrate to like 15 grams of protein or the opposite. No. Yeah. I was just going to give an example. Um, yeah. And I would bump that up a little bit, meaning most women need about 30 grams of protein at a single meal. So now you're looking at about, you know, 50 to 60 grams of carbs per about 30 grams of protein. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. I was just giving the ratio, but if, yeah, if a meal, we want more. And if it's a snack, we want less. I guess. Yeah. And Whatever. yeah. And, and <laughs> when we think about it too, it's depending on our needs. Like if our goal is weight maintenance and we're not doing a lot of exercise, we would go a little bit like one and a half to, to one. Right. Um, right, right. But it's just about pairing. And there's a lot of health benefits of that too, opposed to, you know, having our refined carbohydrates and then our protein later putting them together can be really helpful. Yeah. Can you elaborate on that with the science behind it? Like why is it important to have carbs and protein together? Yeah. I mean, when we think about combining with exercise, we actually know it enhances recovery. Um, And when we, so it helps us replenish kind of our carbohydrate stores in our muscle better than carbohydrates by itself. And obviously Mm -hmm. protein doesn't do a great job of that. Um, And then to me, I think the biggest and most important part is that it um, helps prevent some kind of glucose crashes, helping us feel less tired, giving us more energy. It also um, kind of helps our metabolism kind of stay like it just burns more calories. So regardless of weight loss of your goal, you still want um, your body to to burn the fuel that you feed it and get it Mm -hmm. to where it needs to go. So it, it helps just kind of 
regulate our hormones and our appetite hormones, as well as kind of our, our lipids, our glucose, all that, our insulin, all that good stuff. Okay. Um, and so in regards to, to fat intake, because I mean, I, I feel like keto is still pretty trending right now, but it's not. So it goes in, in and out, but in regards to fat intake, you know, do you believe that, or do, in the re- does the research show that some women might be more benefit, more benefit for more h- higher fat intake than protein or vice versa? Um, is there any research that shows that? Yeah. I mean, I think usually um, fat is compared or replaced with carbohydrates depending on the, on the, mm-hmm. on the goal. But yeah, I mean, every woman is different. I think that when we talk about fat, it's just important to realize that, um, fat is very en- energy dense. So I can have a very small amount and it changes the amount of calories that I'm eating. Mm-hmm. Um, but to me, the bigger conversation is around the t- type of fat. And mm-hmm. most women don't get enough of what, of the omega-3s, kind of the essential fats. And based on our bodies and with age and throughout the menstrual cycle, we do have increased inflammation um, increased kind of muscle damage. And uh, we also have increased kind of um, depression and anxiety as we age. And so that omega-3, those healthy fats are hard to get in the diet, mm-hmm. but focusing on trying to get those through things like salmon, um, you know, other fatty fish, mackerel, herring, sardines, those mm-hmm. things um, can really help kind of the natural inflammation that we have in the body. So mm-hmm. it's not just about amount of fat, but the types of fat. Yeah, I think that's really great. Um, and that's why we're going back to what you said earlier, supplementation can be beneficial if you're not someone who likes to eat fish, you um, don't have access to it, you don't know how to cook it, um, or you just don't feel like you get enough of it and you maybe have tried to do it you know, habitually and it just doesn't work out for you. Also, just as a safety, I feel like, and if you even if you are eating it, but then maybe you're doing like high intensity interval training or you're really living a very stressful lifestyle, like you might benefit from a supplement. So quick little plug i will just say guys in my show notes now that it's coming up i will provide links for a reputable uh omega-3 supplements and a reputable creatine supplement now that i just wanted to make sure i mentioned that so you guys can also you'll get a discount i'll put that in the show notes but um that's why yeah it's really really important so back to what you were sharing about kind of as we get older um we naturally just have inflammation in the body um what other things does do women need to look out for like as as they're aging or or at what age does one now need to start paying attention to maybe a little bit extra this of this nutrient or a little bit extra of that you know mm-hmm. can you can you share a little bit more about that Yeah I mean I would say every age but I think it <laughs> depends I, I mean I think if we think about younger women where they're not so concerned uh I mean that's where you want to get your habits in place but um, I would think like anybody that is pre-menopausal, we would be more thinking about things like vitamin D and iron where you're still menstruating. Um, those would be kind of the bigger things. And then to me, the most important window is this perimenopause and then the, which can be really usually average age is 42 up to 52, but it can be, you know, span a different stage. And that's where we see, um, much higher rates of protein turnover and increased protein needs, as well as changes in bone and anxiety, depression. And so that's Mm -hmm. where you're getting, um, and a lot of women are under eating because they're taking care of everything else. Um, Mm -hmm. lots of changes in gut. So fiber or or they have been putting on weight, Mm -hmm. which I'm not sorry. I now we're jumping because I have a couple questions within that. It's either they're putting on weight, whether it's because, can we actually, okay, I have to ask this. <laughs> Do you think it's they've put on weight because their metabolism has changed or have they put on weight because their lifestyle has changed? Gosh, I think it's both. Okay. Uh, I, I mean, yeah. what I like to tell women is they're not doomed. You right, know, it's not right. like your bodies will change and the science right. absolutely shows that. But I think the science also shows is as which is a better encouragement not to take care of everyone else and to prioritize yourself. If, if you can create some healthy habits um, to build some muscle and, um, you know, and do some exercise and some, you know, healthier nutrition habits 
in your 40s, it will have a much bigger impact. Right, right, um, right. So you're, we- there's, you have an, a, there's an ability to intervene. You're not doomed. But the reason why I brought that up is because you mentioned most women are under eating, but it's also because they're also trying, they're going back to that old mindset yes. of, oh, I've put on some weight. If, you know, I shouldn't eat this or I shouldn't have this because then I'm going to gain more weight. And it's counterproductive once again. Absolutely. And I don't, for, for whatever reason, like women just want to go walk like, or do endless hours of aerobic exercise. And that's great for your mental health. I'm not saying don't, don't exercise. Um, but I mean, really the science shows is you need to not exercise so much and do things that really like help you. And so that would be like some heavy resistance training. And a lot of my work is around high intensity interval training Not because that's the only thing you should do, but it's very time efficient. Like nobody can tell me you don't have six minutes to go do six intervals, um, which would be better than walking for an hour. Right. So, and okay. Wow. Okay. Well, a lot of people are like, wait, no, now I'm confused because I'm a big proponent of walking because of what you said, because of the mental health benefits, because of non-exercise activity, thermogenesis, like big fan. But just to reiterate, you said high intensity interval training is great because no one has time, but you said like six minutes where we know women who are doing high intensity interval training six days a week for an hour. Because they're yeah. doing classes like hit classes that literally their heart rate, the purpose of the of the program of their heart is to get their heart rate high and high and high and high and high multiple days a week. Like, so we're not saying that, right? Mm-mm. We're basically saying the same thing, but it's helping you guys figure out your version of balance and not going, not trying to do too much too quick, but then also being efficient with your time. So if you have the time to walk for an hour, then maybe start with what, like six minutes of high intensity interval training or end with it or something like that. And now you're, I want to say killing two birds with one stone, but it's planting two trees with one seed. It's much more positive. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, and I, I would never tell someone not to go walk. I think it's- No, no, um, I know. But I want to click, I just want a clarity for the listeners because- yeah. Well, and you know, I think sometimes women put the pressure on themselves like, oh, I didn't get to do my exercise today. I, I'm doomed. Like, why even start now? Whereas, or I don't have time to do that much, you know, effort. And well, yeah. And then they over, they overanalyze and they think like, I don't have the time to do it. So then they don't do anything. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and I, I think it's really important that you say, I always say, if someone tells me that they're doing hit six times a week, they're not doing hit. Um, that like you can do high intensity exercise every day, which is not something as a physiologist, I would recommend your body needs to rest and recovery. And that is better for your metabolism anyways. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and you know, there's a number of, of things you're probably then you have to eat more, which is probably not why you're and exercising. They're not, and they're not exactly. <laughs> yes, yeah. Yes. So just yeah. like, like yeah. we make it so hard on ourselves. And I think it's because of the culture, the things that we're told to exercise yeah. more and eat less, which is mm-hmm. um, not good. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Oh man. Okay. This has been so great so far. Okay. Anything else that we didn't talk about that you feel would be important for our listeners to hear? Um, I'm trying to think, I mean, you did bring up perimenopause. So I guess during perimenopause or even menopause, like, are there anything else that women should be looking out for or doing or shifting or changing to support in that process? Maybe more so for the symptoms like night sweats or, um, I don't know, irritability, um, moody. I mean, there's so many things that can come through menopause. Um, any other tips for them? Um, I mean, I think, for this group and falls in line, what you mentioned, I always loved this myth of don't eat past like 7 PM, um, where for women, whether you take the extreme of somebody that's doing hit, you know, high intensity exercise every day, or someone that's more sedentary, actually what some of the science shows is, um, a good kind of bolus or amount of protein before bed can really help with recovery Mm. and help with muscle mass body composition. And Mm -hmm. so, I would say absolutely eat past seven, but, you know, don't be eating ice cream before bed. Um, But that also falls in line. Um, There's some data that suggests night sweats are um, kind of accelerated, exacerbated um, due to hypoglycemia. Hmm. So for example, if I have a meal and I need something sweet after my meal, that's usually a symptom because I haven't eaten enough during the day. And so now I want sweets. And if I have a sweet, then my blood glucose drops at night, which can interrupt my sleep as well as make me sweaty. 
Mm. Um, and so just more motivation for eating kind of a high quality food before you go to bed, for example, like a Greek yogurt parfait or, um, eggs are a really good source. Um, a handful of nuts, like mm-hmm. just something that will help with digestion and provide some amino acids prior to bed. Oh, love that. I love that. Awesome. Oh, you gave so many great tips so far. Are there any other like very like feasible, maybe exercise or nutrition approaches that you would recommend for the women listening? Um, I mean, find something you like and prioritize yourself. So mm. that's to me why I like the hit is just, I know, I mean, I've had two babies and so many other people are I'm taking care of. Um, I can find time to do usually what we look at is one minute on one minute off, um, six to 10 times. And so like you can find 10 minutes for yourself, uh, or even less and and just doing that a couple of times a week can really have huge, um, obviously mental health benefits, but huge, uh, physiological benefits. And we know cardiovascular health is the number one reason women die. And so like really just taking Mm -hmm. control of your health in a very feasible way. Yeah, definitely. So actually, I I forget, you know, as it's more of a nutrition podcast, but I forget you're an exercise physiologist as well. So actually, I would love to if you could give you mentioned, because this is actually motivating for me right now, we're recording this guys, and I'm on vacation, and they have a gym. But for whatever reason, I never feel motivated to work out at the gym. Like I could walk at the treadmill and the gyms on vacations. But like, I don't know, but I want something, but I don't want to waste my time because I want to like enjoy myself. Right. So you're actually motivating me. So I might right after this, just like do something quick in my hotel room. So like, let's just, for example, um, what sorts of movements would you do? And you mentioned, so you said one minute on one minute off six to eight times. Is that what you said? Six times, eight times. So usually we do start someone off if they've not been exercising, we would say like start six times, but okay. I mean, we could all do 10 times. It just depends on how you're working. So. And it's different workouts each yeah. time. Okay. So well, it quick- just depends. Like, yeah. I mean, give me an could- example. I want to be, okay. Okay. give me something to do. I'm going to write it down. I'm gonna okay, do well, it. <laughs> you're, you're talking more about some kind of um, non aerobic based exercise, which is fine. Um, we look at some high intensity resistance training. But what I would say back to your question, you want to stimulate the large muscle group. So that's going to be your booty. Um, And nobody wants a flat booty anyways. Yeah. And I've been sitting, I'm going to be sitting for after you have client calls. So I'm going to be sitting for four hours. So that's why I I need like something in between. (laughs) Well, and so like, I mean, there's lots of things to do, but if you're in your hotel room, you know, I would do some squats, some, some jumps, some push ups. Um, you know, some jumping jacks, really, you're trying to get your heart rate um, elevated, plus contracting some of those muscles. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, And I I mean, you know, that everyone knows this, when you start to do some of this, you get adrenaline and you get endorphins, which makes you feel better. So you don't have to do a whole lot. Um, I mean, personally, I would say go down to the gym, grab a couple dumbbells, add a little bit of load, do the same kind of, you know, but okay. if you don't want to do that, then like stay in your hotel and, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I think one great thing about COVID is now there's so many online resources, like you could YouTube, mm-hmm. like what's a hotel workout and that would be great. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, that's a, that's a good point. So even within that, cause you're right. When I think of high intensity interval trading, I actually don't think of weights with it. So but, we, yeah, we do like a high intensity resistance training approach. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Um, and that's where we would, I think the biggest difference is that women tend to pick up the five pound dumbbells where like we need the 20 pound dumbbells mm. um, or the thirties or the forties, like depending mm-hmm. on your strength, not to mm-hmm. be injured, but that load is really what's going to help not only your muscles, but also your bones. Right. So, so rather than doing light low weight lots of reps you're saying choose heavier weight and even if you could only do like four reps or something that's probably going to be better absolutely and it's faster yeah yes i know i gotta swap i'm actually i go through like um exercise jags i guess you could say i'm always consistent i love movement but I change. I like, so I was following like an exercise program for a while, I think maybe two months and now I'm like ready for something new. So this is might be the new thing that I introduce, especially well, it's good to change it up too. Yeah. Yeah. Especially cause now I'm going to be starting like now my real estate business is actually starting too. So with between the two businesses, I'm going to need something that's a little bit more time efficient. Whereas before that's I good. had more time to do it. So I'm excited. Thank you. 
Yeah. Well, and I'll send you, we've looked at this high intensity resist. I'll, I can send you depending on what equipment you have, but just think, Thank yeah, you. heavier load, fewer reps. I love it. I'm excited. I'm excited. I love podcasting because I always meet really great people and I always, you know, teaching other people, but learning for myself. So that's, that's part of why we're here, right? Yeah. As well. That's so great. Oh my God. Well, this has been great. Is there anything else you want to leave for our listeners before we wrap up today and let people know where they can find you? Um, I don't, I mean, just that reminder of, of, um, take care of yourself. I mean, easier said than done, but like women, um, it just the science and we all know it makes such a big impact of when you turn 50 and 60 of what you do in your thirties and your forties. Mm, yeah. And it, and it's true. It's, you can't that say not that anybody who's old, who's old aged, but you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Like it's really true. Like, so the sooner you learn to prioritize yourself and the sooner you begin to set those boundaries and really just to like, you know, engage in those healthier behaviors, it will get easy, easier. And you won't have to make as many changes as you get older, but it'll even be easier to make the changes when you need to, because you already been doing it for like years. Absolutely. And the, the older women out there, like it's never too late to start too. I think that's, what's so amazing about the human body and the muscles and the bones is that you can always get stronger and build muscle, which is directly linked to health and quality of life. Yeah, for sure. Oh my God. It's been so great. All right, Abby, let people know where they can find you if they want to connect with you or ask questions. Well, I don't do a great job on social media, but I am on Instagram and Twitter, um, email, and then I have a website in my um, university website. I'm If you Google me, I'm easy to find, but um, um, try and put some content out there. All right, cool. Well, I have your Instagram. It seems like you do a good job with posting there. So I'll put the Instagram link in the show notes if that's okay. Yeah, and that's, that's where great. people, that'll be their main source to reach out to you. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you so much for being here. For everyone listening, thank you for being here. Um, if you liked what you heard, definitely take a screenshot of it, share it on your stories and tag me at tips underscore with underscore Tony with an I or the tips with Tony podcast and also tag Abby or share it with a friend. If you haven't subscribed to the podcast, definitely hit that subscribe button. A new episode comes out every Tuesday and Thursday. And when you're subscribed, you don't miss a beat. All right. That's it from us today. Thank you so much for listening. I'm Tony Marinucci, your registered dietitian, helping you get healthy one bite at a time. 